Thank you everyone for joining us um, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, we're excited to and, and definitely love the opportunity to share with you our thinking around how we're rebuilding supply chains and becoming more responsible, more transparent, and more um, more more visible across across the network. So um, hopefully you can hear me. If you see my mouth moving and you can read my lips but you don't hear me, please drop something in the Q&A and let us know. But um, my name is Tom Fahey. I work in our supply chain offering within our blockchain and multi-party systems group at Accenture. Um, I've been working in the supply chain space. I'm a supply chain guy predominantly who has recently been introduced to the to the wonders of multi-party systems and blockchain. Um, but over that 15 year career have worked in warehousing, transportation, planning, fulfillment, and especially procurement have spent a lot of time thinking about our platforms, automation, applied intelligence um, tools that we bring bring to our clients. But recently um, I've been thinking about and working with, with people like Tal and the rest of our, our group and our, and our clients and ecosystem partners, thinking about how we can use multi-party systems and multi-party organizations to truly change the way we organize our supply chains. And I think what we have to share here today is, is an exciting introdu introduction to that. So Tal, I'll hand it over to you for a quick introduction. Thanks, Tom, and it's great to be with everyone today. My name is Tal Visk, and I lead our sustainable supply chain work in Accenture's multi-party systems team. And prior to this role, I spent eight years with uh, our social impact arm called Accenture Development Partnerships, focusing on some of our development sector clients in the conservation space like World Wildlife Fund and Rainforest Alliance and others. All this to say I've had one foot uh, solidly in the private sector and then the other uh, in the public and civil society sector. So I'll try to bring both perspectives today. And practically what this means in my day-to-day -day job is looking after our portfolio of work in, in the space where supply chain and sustainability converge, whether that's making our global supply chains greener, thinking about the people and how this how we create more inclusive, equitable supply chains, and at the same time, also setting them up to be resilient, competitive, and prime time ready for the next disruption. So I think this session will we'll try to cover many of these topics. Um, we'll try to do as much justice as we can in, in, in the 30 minutes we have together. So with those intros, back to you, Tom. Very good. So I, I'm actually gonna start us far away from the supply chain and far away from the chaos of the last year, um, both temporarily, physically, and mentally, hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna rewind us back to late spring 1988, right around, right around this, this time of year. Um, and squarely in Yellowstone National Park. Now, for those of you that know your, um, you know, your, 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 your history of, of the area, know that in just a couple weeks from now, the largest fire kind of in recorded history and in, in recent in any kind of modern history raged through Yellowstone National Park in the, the late spring and summer of, of 1988. Um, you know, the, the fire was unique in the intensity with which it burned. It, it destroyed much of the tree life. It destroyed and and much of the underlying kind of flora and fauna of the area. Um, and this was a, you know, we, I think we've learned quite a bit. You know, these fires happen every 100 to 200 years. Um, and the story I'm going to tell is not just simply one of kind of regeneration. And, you know, we, I think that some of those processes are well understood. But I'm going to drill into, if you go to Yellowstone today, you'll see an absolute preponderance of a specific species called the lodgepole pine. And what the lodgepole pine does is it creates two different kinds of cones, one of which is used 99 out of 100 to 199 out of 200 years to reproduce, and one specialized cone that actually only becomes activated and only releases seeds once uh, when it is activated by the extreme heat and temperatures of fires. And so what happened that spring and summer was that the lodgepole pine forest was destroyed, but the cones that are left behind for this truly black swan event were left behind, and now it is one of the dominant um, flora in in the in the forest that were impacted by the fire in Yellowstone. And so, I I love that story because it it makes me think about kind of what we've just been through in the last year, right? I have a sneaky suspicion that if our supply chains had planned for the one in a hundred to one in two hundred kind of black swan event of the last two years, I I may have had a very different toilet paper situation back last April, May, June. Um, I think that our auto manufacturers may not be you know, looking at shutdowns because of, of lack of supply and lack of parts. We won't be seeing the, the supply chain disruptions we're seeing all over the world. And I think that there is something really interesting to learn about the 
the resiliency, the backup systems, the, the measures that nature takes to control for and plan, so to speak, to the extent I can, I can uh, anthropomorphize nature itself, um, plan for these black swan events. And if only we could start thinking about our supply chains and our supply networks in the same sort of resilient, redundant, and cooperative ways that, that natural systems solve some of these problems. And so it all starts with transparency. And, and I think when we kind of pivot now to, to kind of try, tie my, my trees into, into supply chains, you know, and to get transparency, you need this underlying trust and cooperation among the entities in the enterprise. And I think what's exciting about where we see supply chains today is that we are on the cusp of establishing the underlying technological changes that allow us to build trust, build cooperation, ultimately build transparency down throughout our value chains today. And what, what does that transparency give you? you know, it, may, it may give you visibility to an order just a little earlier. It may give you visibility to all the suppliers and all the actors deep in your supply chain. And ultimately we then build that into and build the cooperative networks on that transparency to get the resilience that we see in, in nature and in some of the, the most responsive supply chains that exist today. Ultimately, we wanna be more resilient and able to weather those disruptions and provide that operational agility. Now this, this is both you know, good for companies in the bottom lines, good for us as consumers. And ultimately, we think that these come together very nicely and Tal's gonna share some examples in, in a few minutes around how transparency and resiliency come together and they enable actors and supply chains to start making decisions that are truly more responsible. And so, you know, we're gonna come at this from, you know, nature doesn't respond quite as well to incentives as supply chains do. You know, there is something truly human and truly, truly, uh, you know, real about how we respond to incentives. But some of what we're gonna talk about is how transparency allows supply chains to start building in the incentives and creating the networks that enable them to start making responsible and resilient decisions and ultimately change the way that that we that we think about supply chains. And so it all starts with visibility. And visibility is hard, right? Visibility requires trust. Visibility requires cooperation. Visibility requires platforms that enable you to share data and trust what you're sharing to whom, when, how, etc. And visibility, you know, some of the harder problems of visibility, right? I, you know, in a perfect world, we would be able to see my entire supply chain's inventory position and production capacity for the next year, all shared, all in one place. Now, that's hard, right? That that takes a ton of trust, and we are, I think, quite a bit away from from that notion. But let's start with something more more basic. Let's start with supplier data. Supplier data is maintained by every single corporate entity around the world for all of their suppliers, and then a duplicate set of that same data is maintained in as customer data in a whole nother set of, of supply uh, in ERPs and, and supply chain systems. The preponderance of that data, so it's in thousands and thousands of different systems, it is being managed and reconciled by literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world are doing nothing but ensuring that these different copies of the same data, most of which is not terribly proprietary, um, you know, some is, but the vast majority of which is not sensitive or proprietary in traditional nature are duplicating this experience and duplicating this data around these platforms. And so I, I think I love starting visibility at some of these basic kind of blocking tackling steps of if we can only enable a supplier to share data once and build that visibility around a supply chain and create a trusted identity using some of the technologies that we, we love and are seeing being fostered in the Hyperledger Foundation, we can use these technologies to build that base visibility so that as an, you know, an apex kind of CPG company or as a a global kind of food cooperative or as a you know, high tech um, kind of supplier, I can now get visibility and understand exactly who is in my supply chain. And maybe not exactly who, maybe not that it is Bob's farm that is supplying milk to me, but I can get to the granularity that says, all of my farms are complying with this set of standards that I trust. And I, I therefore can begin to, as I move to number two, create the incentives and begin to buy sustainably and use the power of visibility to grow, engage, and improve my suppliers. And this, uh, you know, number two is where I, I spend the most time with clients in talking about the incentives that exist in a supply chain. That if a coffee grower wants to enact sustainability practices, they need to be sure that they're gonna get paid, right? Those are more expensive. They need to ensure that they're gonna be paid for their sustainable farming practices. 
And therefore, we need to ensure that we can track that that sustainable product is differentiated when all those beans are poured into a hopper, you know, three steps of the supply chain, they go through a consolidator, through local markets, through, you know, they're poured onto ships, they go to processors, they go to, and they, they land in your Starbucks. You know, the ability in the systems that we need to prove that the coffee that I'm pouring and the coffee that I'm buying is actually sustainably sourced is an extremely complex problem that starts first with visibility. And so there is no company in the world that can actually drive their supply to, to behave in a, more, in a more responsible manner without having visibility first to that supply. And this, this applies to the, the coffee grower, this applies to the farmer and thinking about how can we create a connection between the consumer and that farmer to, to incentivize and create a monetary transaction that enables a consumer of that cup of coffee to pay that specific farmer and, and show appreciation for, for the responsible decisions they're making. It applies to you know, huge corporations and the ability to get financing. If I can't prove that my steel is more sustainably produced than the competitors and it's all entering a, a wholesale steel market, then I have no incentive to go invest the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars it takes to improve my fabrication processes and foundry processes and, and create the, the sustainable marks of the future. And so in order to, uh, our, our clients and, and the, the, the supply chains and consumers are, are now willing to pay for these, for these improvements and these investments and, these, and, driving, and driving sustainable outcomes. But we need the visibility first in order to do it. And I think that it, it, that visibility then takes these multi-party systems and ultimately the sorts of technology investments that, are, that we are seeing emerge to bring that, bring that story to life. And then ultimately, we land on, we land on um, kind of the operate and transform that once we have that visibility and we're driving improvements in our supply base, we can now get real-time visibility, traceability, and, and, and um, kind of responsible behaviors in our supply chain. We can see that in real time. And so we think about these three steps. First of all, creating visibility. Second, creating the mechanisms in the markets that we can use to encourage growth and improvement in our supply chains. And then ultimately tying those supplier behaviors to the actual piece of steel, the actual bar of steel, the actual you know, truckload of coffee that I'm moving through our supply chain. And that's how we ultimately drive to the outcomes that we talked about earlier about being responsible, being visible, and, and being um, resilient. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Tal for a few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the specific work we're doing and how we're bringing this to life across a couple of our, our clients. Great. Thanks so much, Tom. And I loved your tree and nature analogy. I think that really brings it to life around the resiliency that we're talking about here for supply chains. I know there's a lot of words on this screen. I'll try not to be married to them. Uh, in this next section, and we really want to bring it to life with two, two living examples. You know, what does this look like in practice? How does it actually build resilience and drive value that, that my colleague Tom spoke about up front? The first, uh, which you see here on the screen, is a collaborative initiative. And collaborative is kind of the, the, the imperative word here. One that we're doing with the World Economic Forum. And the second example you'll see uh, in just a minute is a specific example focused around a tech component supply chain. So two very different examples here. One more in the humanitar humanitarian sector and the second much more in the kind of private sector high tech space. So let's jump in with this, with this first example. Um, I want to echo a few of the points that my my colleague Tom mentioned. The first is that the the challenge of poor global visibility on the movement of goods in the humanitarian sector and even in the private sector is not new. Uh, this challenge existed long before COVID-19, and I'm sure it will still be here even after COVID-19. Um, I think what the COVID-19 pandemic has done, however, is highlighted that these pre-existing vulnerabilities and the fragility of global supply and logistic systems really do impact food, sanitary, healthcare products, and ultimately have an impact on humanitarian needs as well. And the root of all of these problems, in, in my view, is really that lack of visibility across the supply chain. And that lack of real-time end-to-end visibility across that global system, this macro global system, includes and touches on everything from port congestion to transit delays to natural disasters, even to the so socioeconomic disruptions that we see around the world, whether that be strikes or civil unrest. And this makes it very challenging to plan and to anticipate risks and to optimize decisions and resources. And this is only worsened, of course, by the fact that 
this information is very fragmented and, and, and in many cases inadequate. Um, these impacts on this first example in particular are particularly hard felt in the humanitarian sector as the global community tries to respond to source and then deliver goods essential to addressing this response, uh, whether that be on the health front, on the food front, on the security front. And there's a real human cost here. And you can see the quote here from an Oxfam study just um, this past year, the, the, the kind of sad fact that you know 12,000 people across the globe could die each day um, from hunger linked to the to the you know pandemic. Um, and the truth here is that there's no single body entity, organization, or company that can solve these challenges of supply system visibility by themselves. Uh, the challenges are far too complex and they're global in nature. And so meaningful change will come about back to the tree analogy and the nature analogy, back to collaborative action, back to working across diverse stakeholders towards that common goal. And so one of the supply chain resilience initiatives that, it, that we, Accenture, have been supporting to solve for this complex challenge is, is one that has been pioneered by uh, the World Economic Forum, and I'll share a little bit more uh, on this. The, the goal is ultimately to form a coalition, a coalition of diverse stakeholders that are willing to share anonymized public and private sector data and facilitate a truly open source pre-competitive dashboard. And that dashboard seeks to do three things. One, provide near real-time visibility of supply system system-wide performance. The second is to highlight sourcing and distribution systems, so knowing where those disruptions and bottlenecks are occurring. And then, of course, to do something preemptive with this information, informing choices and enabling you know, agile action and, and you know, really building that resiliency in the system for the next dis disruption. And we've learned, I think, um, you know, time and time again that the, 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 the way to succeed is to bring these parties together in, in these kind of multi-party systems environments. In this particular example, we're talking about humanitarian entities, public and regulatory bodies, producers and suppliers of these goods, and of course the transportation and logistics and industry players that are you know, dealing with this data and information every day. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe just say one, one more thing and then I'll move to the second example. Um, the other, I think really, important point on this example is we found that a lot of the work here is in, in, in building the right governance and data sharing model. And, and that again goes back to your point, Tom, on how do we create that transparency, that trust and create the right incentives as well for participation. And it's this, this enabling technology that we're speaking about today that can really help underpin such solutions. So I think in summary on this one, it's a great example of, of how through collective action and shared responsibility, um, we can create this more trusted environment for data sharing and ultimately have a, you know, an impact for good. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, and and Tal, I will, I will stop. There is a question around where the audience can get more information about the initiative and, and what WEF is doing in the, in the humanitarian sector. Yeah, and I think maybe we can follow up. I'll, I'll come back to that question at the end um, in, in terms of, you know, where we can share more. Um, I'll just mention the, the second example which is we're looking at here on this slide, essentially the procure, a procured to provision um, distribution process for technical components. So think about the, the process from manufacturing all the way to distribution. And again, I think you'll hear me sort of echo some of the same points here. You know, it's, it's challenging enough to know what's going on in your own supplier, uh, you know, environment and ecosystem when you're dealing with your own direct suppliers and, and much more challenging when it's outside your walls. So as we think about, you know, topics like um, managing uh, end tier suppliers, those are suppliers that are, are a few tiers down where you, you may not exert direct influence, you know, that, that really starts to become more challenging. And so these models I think what's really important to, to keep in mind here, as long as these external data silos exist, it's going to be a very expensive pain in the neck process to measure things like emissions or waste, because that full footprint is not just that one single organizations, but the collective footprint of all of those actors in the e ecosystem at the end of the day. So having this data, as we think kind of left to right here, having this data can really help to improve intelligent sourcing decisions, drive efficiency in back office, better assess risks like human rights and climate, hence the nod here at the bottom to 
scope three emissions, and finally optimize you know on hand inventory and that supply and demand matching to really reduce reduce waste overall. Uh, the good news is, uh, you know, that we have the tools now to come together around that single source of truth across the supply chain. And I think what's what this innovation and a shared ledger enables that other technologies don't is that collaboration across the ecosystem. So as we think about this example, you know, lots of moments here to take this collaboration further in the way that more granular data is shared across participants, whether that be across the, the purchase order, the shipment, the invoice, the, the data that's being exchanged all across this and having that one single source of truth. So I think that's all I'll say, um, Tom, I'll, I'll come back to the question now uh, around WEF. This is definitely a work in progress in terms of the, the collaborative initiative that we talked about. We are hoping to make um, some more public announcements later in this year, in, later in this year, timed around some of the WEF initiatives. Um, so we haven't actually broadcasted too widely yet. You're, you're all getting a little bit of a sneak sneak peek preview here, uh, but in the coming months, we'll be making more of this um, more widely in, available. And of course, feel free to reach out to myself and Tom if you'd like a little bit more detail or have some further further questions after the session. Tom, back back over to you. Yeah, and, and what I throw out across all about both those examples, right? In, in the WEF example, you know, WEF is a fantastic globally known organization that has the pull to kind of drive this sort of cooperative change. And in this high tech example, it's a similar kind of apex, you know, household name brand who carries some sway, significant sway with their supply markets. And so what we're seeing is number one, this, this instinct, especially on the commercial side for, for these kind of what I think of as kind of the apex, apex buyers of these to um, um, some of the apex buyers to, um, to, to bring their suppliers along. But what we find is that when you have that apex buyer motion, we have to fight every instinct that they have to make this a proprietary way to drive more, squeeze more out of, out of their supply chain. Because ultimately, you know, that, that cooperative motion, that cooperative movement, that cooperative instinct is something that, um, is something that we were working with our, our buyers to, to develop and to think about these as not how can I extract every penny and, and squeeze, 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 but how do you make sure you remain cognizant of the value you are creating throughout the chain? How can you think about the suppliers and what they're getting and, and their ability to, as you know, a key example, how can visibility to a supplier and their practices enable ways for them to more easily get financing, whether that's trade financing, whether that's for supply chain improvements. So thinking about creating value for all the players in the ecosystem is absolutely critical. A WEF kind of thinks about that naturally, but when we're thinking of this more in a corporate in a corporate um, standing, I think it's something to always keep in mind is, you know, what is the value of the tier one integrator who's combining parts? What is the value of the hub? How can they get better visibility into supply demand signals? And ultimately in the tier two manufacturer, how can they uh, begin to prove, you know, some of those are ultimately really interested in provenance. How do I prove that this is a, you know, a, you know to pull a household name and an, an AMD branded chip or an Intel branded chip and NVIDIA, right? How do I prove the, the provenance and downstream and, uh, you know, eliminate risks around counterfeit? So thinking about the value pools across all those different players is absolutely critical. Um, so ultimately, when we think about, um, you know, wh where we're landing, there's, there's a complete reimagination of the supply chain. Um, and that's from this disparate, uncoordinated, I'd say, you know, mess um, to this a, a deeper kind of deeper understanding right, that what we think about as the multi-party system promise, right? And I, I it's, it's down on the fourth bullet, but I, I've been using the word frictionless so much more now. I think we we stumbled upon that and in, in one of our brainstorming sessions a, a couple months ago. But this notion of frictionless business and whether that is eliminating the friction for me to prove where a part came from, or eliminating the friction to reconcile an invoice with a with an order. Um, you know, eliminating those frictions allow us, or eliminating the friction of, of distrust, right? There are all sorts of different forms of friction that exist that ultimately will allow us to cooperate more effectively, create the incentives, and move the entire supply chain forward. Um, and we, we're talking about this as sort of this one connected supply chain vision. It's around how can I get visibility? And, you know, I, and I'm sort of going to sideways hit, Tom, a bit of your question on open supply chain, and then Tal, happy to hear you say more. I think that um, the way we see this evolving 
is and at least near term right is not as a single wide open network but how does each industry invest in the use cases that really matter to them and i think what we're going to see emerge is a series of um you know it's how mentioned the the food you know maybe a, a wef or a or um you know a distributor that are, that's deep in the food um the food system provokes the the creation of a food based um a food based network we're going to see the emergence of a high tech supply network like we alluded to earlier maybe there's one in um oil and gas or maybe there's one in natural resources steel some of these some of these key components um are going to emerge in some of their own networks and i think what's incumbent upon us as you know business quasi technologists quasi thought leaders is to think about carefully about the design of those networks so that they can scale and and come together so tom not exactly addressing your question but um, I think we can we can spend more time thinking about kind of a compare and contrast with open supply chain um, in, in offline if, if you're interested. Um, but I think that notion of bringing together some of these networks in a way that can interoperate, right? That I, we love the work that Hyperledger is doing around interoperation because there are going to be different technology decisions and choices made across these networks. And I think that ultimately we're you know we're we're going to be thinking about how to make it as frictionless as possible for companies to join multiple networks. So I think of an auto manufacturer may need to join the sustainably sourced rubber, steel, auto parts, oh, and they have high tech components, right? How do we, how do we make that a scalable and an effective motion? Um, but ultimately it's going to be about how do we create these networks and, and use, use our partnerships and ecosystems um, from all the kind of household brand names across ERPs and, and business process software. Um, how do we make that transition as seamless as possible to truly bring this to life in this in this one connected supply chain network? But Tal, um, anything else you want to add? Yeah, no, that was very well said, Tom. I mean, I think for me, it's uh, you know, without getting the specifics of different networks, I mean, I think we acknowledge there's different data sharing initiatives in sub parts of the supply system, but what's missing, I think, in my view, is those aggregated views that truly will transform industries or cross industries, and that's, I think, what what we're seeing and being required and, and where I think the, the, the future will be. So going beyond those kind of really deep sub parts of the supply chain to the more aggregated views and figuring out what are those models that, that honestly uh, companies, companies and also the public sector feel comfortable in that, in that model, sharing data, not sharing necessarily, you know, competitive proprietary data, but sharing in a way that, that, that promotes that trust and um, folks can get behind. Absolutely. Um, with that, I open it for any other questions, um, or it, we may actually be able to give you 90 seconds to run and do whatever you need to do before your next session. But happy to happy to hover here for a few more minutes and see if there are any other any other questions from from the group. And and thank you very much for your time. We appreciate the opportunity and, and love to love that you uh, were willing to spend uh, 30 minutes of your day here with us. Thank you very much. Echoing that. Thanks, everyone. All right, a question, Charity. Charity, the, the biggest, I, there's a major challenge around kind of on-chain, off-chain, and I don't want to get too technical, but, and I, I, would, um, I would get in trouble if I were becoming too technical, but I, I think that the major thing we have to make sure that participants understand is on-chain, off-chain data sharing and, and security, right? I think that there, there's a very logical explanation to the, you know, we get the question all the time of, you know, I, blockchain and therefore and Bitcoin sound sound scary, right? And you know, this this is very much right. The hyperledger is an expert at explaining at explaining why this is different than the permissionless networks that that pervade some of the the crypto space and the energy requirements, et cetera. But I think the biggest challenge is still there's a very we were just ha we were having this discussion earlier actually with with a client who's trying to build a network and 
a lack of understanding of the corporate IT departments around okay, if this is on the blockchain, who has a copy of my data, who doesn't, and being very specific. And it's even it's even as deep as developing the vocabulary that we used to describe. The you know, on-chain, off-chain doesn't really mean a lot, right? Even among among people who know who know the technology, it doesn't mean a lot. But figuring out the vocabulary and the way that we talk about who has what copies of data in what context and how we make that security model visible, auditable, inspectable, verifiable, et cetera, I think is really key. So it's I, I think, you know, right now every time we have one of these client discussions, it's a it's a bit of a from scratch. Okay, here's what data you have, here's what data this partner has, and here's the points in the process at which at which it, it is shared. Um, but but I truly think a lot of it is is going to come down to developing the voc the shared vocabulary. Right? We we have a shared vocabulary on how we just and there are, and there are standards um, that establish like how we describe security in a data center, for instance, right? And when we were first talking data centers and clouds, you know, you know, data centers 20, 30 years ago, and, and cloud, you know, 10 years ago, you know, it was very soft. And it, it, cloud is even more recent, right? Cloud, we went from we have to have this conversation from scratch with every client to there's now a set of vocabulary around whether it's hybrid, virtual, et cetera, that describes so describes some of these technology patterns. So I think it's really going to take some work for us as an entire industry to establish some of the standards around how we talk about how data is shared and who can see what and when. Um, and then ultimately that will guide. So it's it's really in that info second data security standard, I think, charity from my point of view. I don't know, Tal, if you would. Yeah, that's a great, it's a good question. Thanks for that one. I just add one thing to Tom's answer there. And I would say that I think one of the challenges and one of the an first answers before you get to the technology is actually what's the business model or the operating model that's going to support the the whatever solution, whatever data sharing construct it ends up being, and um, focusing in on that first. Uh, you know, as a as as an example, I mean, one of the fundamental questions when you're working in consortiums and ecosystem, and some of the call might might have experienced doing this themselves, um, is thinking about what is the willingness and interest of those parties to share data or share certain cer certain parts of the data in the ecosystem? And are they comfortable sharing that in a distributed fashion and, and kind of getting to the heart of some of the core business model questions? I think if there's alignment out of the gate uh, in that kind of initial ecosystem, you're going to get a lot further then if you only find out much later, you've, you've sort of tried to solve the technology and then you find out later, actually, there's not a lot of alignment on the business model and strategy and governance around how all of these operators, um, for lack of a better word, are, will work together. So I think that's a big challenge. And I think that actually is where the real effort lies. The technology is proven, but the, the, the real work is that kind of transformation governance, you know, model work that that needs to happen uh pretty early on Tal since you have the mic did you want to hit Ignacio's question I, I have some thoughts I know you've spent quite a bit of time in, in food and he's looking especially at small farms traders distributors and specialty specialty foods and I assume that um, Ignacio a lot of that is around proof of provenance proof that you're getting this small batch honey and not the the I don't know the honey supply chain particularly well but I assume there's quite a provenance challenge on Natal if you wanted to um, yeah, I think it's a yeah, it's a good one. I have spent some time in the agriculture and farming space, food industry. So, and uh, I'll try to do this quickly because I know there might be a couple other questions mm -hmm. here. But um, I think, in addition to sort of thinking about the provenance and traceability of the product down to origin, whether that be around sustainable farming practices or wanting to prove that you know the, the coffee beans are of a certain quality, so sourced in a certain way, I think the other big one. It, that I've seen the other big challenge or kind of insight is how to actually create solutions. I mean, the, the average, probably the average um, kind of farmer or user of the network is not even going to be aware that this is built on a distributed ledger. So how do we create low cost intuitive solutions that actually work for people on the ground? I mean, you know, it's particularly I've seen in, in sort of emerging markets that farmer's time is very precious, um, as you may, as you probably know, Ignacio. So how do we create those kind of low cost, intuitive models that actually, and solutions that actually return something to the farmer? If mobile you can do person. that. Mm -hmm. oh. If you can do that, that then I think you're, no, no. Go ahead. So I hope that, I hope that helps. 
And now, so I'll throw in that, you know, what we're seeing as well is, um, you know, food safety standards and regulation are beginning to really drive this space. And I, what, we're, what we're talking about quite a bit is you know, how to, you know, the, the, the regulations that are rolling out now are only going to become more significant, more severe is wrong, severe is a bad word, but more, they're only going to become more, more rigorous in the future. Um, and so how do you start to invest now to be a leader in that regulatory space? And therefore, like, how, how do you use, you know, for example, the, there's, a, there's a new FDA draft rule around traceability of, of material. How do you use compliance with that to actually catalyze a leap forward and, and getting greater visibility than the rule actually requires, right? And I think, um, you know, so it's, it's a little more, that's a little more targeted at the, the, the big players, but I, I think this, the same effects are gonna apply at the smaller, when the smaller players as well, that they're going to be seeking some way to comply with, with rulings. And, you know, the, the, I forget what the, there is some level at which um, a small farm is, is, you know, exempt, but it's, it's really, really, really small. It's not much bigger than the backyard garden I have, I have here. So just about anyone who's commercially producing is going to be, is going to be required, but um, you know, thinking about the regulatory shifts and how those are going to drive change and using that change to catalyze into, into, you know, don't just think about compliance with the rule. Think about compliance with the rule and and how you can change change the way you're practicing and the and the way you're interacting with your with your broader value network um, as a result. Um, anything else? Other questions? Well, I'll I'll hover here for another couple minutes just in case uh, anyone uh, pops on, but. How can you juggle or something to uh... <laughs> these, are, these are good questions and uh, I'm glad folks stayed on for a few extra minutes. Happy to also linger uh, if folks have any other questions. Retail, we're getting the uh, tell you you you've done some retail work lately. I know I've. Do you want to take this one first? Or want me to take? Yeah. Do you want to yeah. jump in? I'm happy to take a first swing and then Tom build on this. Um, yeah, I do think there's probably some use cases in retail or responsible retail that surface to the top for me. Um, I think sustainable sourcing, as we've talked about today, is a big is a big topic. I also think the consumer engagement side in retail is really important. How are you interact, interacting with the customer and how are you building that kind of enhanced augmented product experience in ways that build that, that trust? And I think the other one that's interesting in retail as a use case is probably around fraud and thinking about I mean, authenticity in, in certain particularly luxury retail markets is a huge topic, huge, huge losses around fraud and counterfeit. And those are probably three use cases or spaces that I see getting a lot of play and interest um, and where I think, you know, technologies like this can, can help solve. Well, one of the other ones we kicked around for, <laughs> top, I don't know if you were involved in these discussions, this I'm pulling back from a year, two years ago, is trade promotions and the complex relationships between um, between your consumer goods manufacturers yeah. and your retailers and the reconciliation, the, the massive reconciliation process around trade promotions. Um, I don't think we've seen as much interest in that, but that, that was always an early an early use case that we thought about in the retail space, but I think there's still an opportunity there um, around just the massive back office operations it takes to verify you know, the trade promotion and the, whether the sale was sold with the promotion and, and the, you know, the all the exchange of value between retailers and the consumer goods. And even as far as, you know, end caps and position on shelves, there's just a really complex um, pricing and, and exchange of value that, that's going on um, among among those parties that um, we've always viewed as an opportunity or we never, I think, really cracked it or, but that's another one that pops up for me um, in the retail space. Absolutely.
All right. I think uh, we've, we've done 10 minutes. I'll, I'll give it another 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, returns are huge. Hey, return. Yeah, return, returns are absolutely huge. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And we see returns both in retail, but I mean, the, the warranty processes, we were talking automotive and warranty processes and you know the provenance of parts within warranty process and what's on your car, right? There are warranties and returns and getting that. And then ultimately tying it back to the green theme, your know, circularity um, are really huge and you know, all the way through disposal and or reuse um, recycle of, of, a, of, of goods, but absolutely have returns. And um, yeah, I think about the warranty and repairs and the fraud involved in, in some of those processes also huge. Um, yeah, I think it's a good nod, Tom, to the secondary markets too, that if you think about circular economies and kind of these closed loop systems, then it really starts to get interesting. Um, you know, not just being able to prove you have the the right to that product that or the, the warranty, what have you, the claim, but um, what does that look like after the product is near retirement? And is there a sec, is there a second life for it? And, and what does that cycle look like? So that I think that gets interesting pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And then Providence, I mean, if, if you think of a retailer and how much is white label or if you're in a, in a branded retail situation, right, the Providence of goods and counterfeits is, you know, you, you look a lot like a, a manufacturer or a consumer goods company, um, depending on which, which form of retail you're in. So, all right. With that, Tal, you want the last word or is my uh, riffing on right. that be it? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for either the 11 people who uh, – are actually here or who uh, walked away and forgot to push the leave button. We appreciate it. Maybe Tal and I have been talking to a, or, and Charity have been talking to a nearly empty room for the last uh, five minutes, but uh, we appreciate it and this has been fun. Thank you everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of the day.